UCSF Medical School. Thank you to my longtime mentor, Philippe Bourgois, for, to be here to um, take us through the Q&A and to join in some, sharing some of the stories from El Salvador. Um, hello to UCSF alumni. If some of you were my teachers or my classmates, thank you so much for joining. It's such an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to share slides, so um, please just bear with me for a moment as I pull them up and then we'll leave hopefully ample, ample time for your questions. So um, let me get this in presenter view. Wonderful. Okay, so I'll be talking about um, my new book, Reunion, Finding the Disappeared Children of El Salvador, with an excellent forward by Philippe Bourgois. So um, I'm going to start off by telling you the story of the disappeared children of El Salvador through the story of somebody who I admire um, very much. Her name is Andrea. Um, I'm just going to jump right into it. So to the audience, um, please know that these um, stories are real and, and they're difficult stories. Um, so in from 1980 to 1992, there was a civil war in El Salvador. It was a very brutal war. And um, this photograph that you see on the top right hand corner um, is a photograph of the countryside in El Salvador. Philippe actually took this photo. Um, and what happened in the war was that the Salvadoran military, heavily funded by the U.S. government, targeted civilians um, as a way to terrorize them and, and keep them from providing any kind of support to um, what was called the FMLN, um, which was considered the, the revolutionary movement. And during that process, tens of, um, tens of thousands of children became separated from their families. So um, a lot of families, the ones who survived, um, fled to Honduras. So this is also one of Philippe's photographs from the um, a re refugee camp in Honduras. Bef even before the Civil War ended, mothers started coming forward and saying their children were missing. Some children got lost from their families in the chaos of war. So people were running from their lives uh, for their lives from the military. Um, in other instances, children were actually kidnapped um, at gunpoint by soldiers um, and then put into an international adoption market um, and sent to countries like the United States and Canada and many European countries. And probably there was an element of human trafficking and, and profit involved. Um, and in other instances, um, families place their children in informal adoptions within El Salvador. Um, so what happened with Andrea, and you're gonna hear her story through her family's words also, is that her family was running through the countryside um, during a prolonged military attack. And um, a piece of shrapnel um, severed Andrea's arm and her, her father could no longer carry her because he was carrying two children. So he set Andrea down um, and, and then Andrea got taken with um, dozens of other Salvadoran children um, into a military helicopter um, and the military then handed the children over to the Salvadoran Red Cross um, who placed this group of children in an orphanage. Um, this photograph that you see here is a photo of Andrea's mother holding a photograph of her missing child. In um, 1992, the Civil War ended, and in 1994, Andrea was found. So this is a photograph of Andrea's reunion event. Um, this is Andrea here in the middle. Here's her mom who was holding the photograph of her, and this is her dad. Um, and all amazingly, all of her siblings survived. Um, the reason that Andrea was found, it was really quite a miracle. Um, one of her relatives, a cousin, um, was um, working as a gardener at the orphanage, and he, re he noticed that there was a child without an arm. Um, it's this arm that's missing that you can't see. And, and so he told, his, he told her parents, and Andrea was the first disappeared child found, and that led to a movement. Um, and the, Andrea's parents were living in a resettlement community. So it was a community of hundreds of Salvadorans who had returned from exile. And so many of them were missing children too. And so when Andrea reunited with her family on the soccer field um, in this rural town called Guajila in Chalatenango, lots of other families said, hey, I have missing children too. 
And so they were talked with a, um, a Jesuit priest named Father John Cortina. He's photographed here. Um, and this grew into a movement. The movement um, really centered around a, a small nonprofit in El Salvador called Asociación Pro Búsqueda. Um, and I had the pleasure, the privilege to work with them when I was a medical student at UCSF. Um, and here's a, a photograph so you can get a feel for the movement. This is a photograph of... Um, the of the relatives of the disappeared and the disappeared children marching in the capital in San Salvador, um, asking for justice and for assistance in the search for the disappeared ch children. Um, so how do I come into this picture? So um, I entered medical school in 2004 um, as a medical student in the UC Berkeley UCSF joint medical program. So my first summer um, from medical school, um, I was fortunate to earn a fellowship, a summer fellowship from the UC Berkeley Human Rights Center. Um, and so I went down to El Salvador. Um, Eric Stover from the UC Berkeley Human Rights Center was my mentor. I, um, I went to him and I said, I wanna understand how war affects children's health. Um, and so he gave me the contact information of ProBusqueda. And in partnership with Physicians for Human Rights and UC Berkeley Human Rights Center, my, um, my role there was to help build a DNA bank or a DNA database that would match um, the, the missing children with their families. And so I went with this wonderful group of people all over the Salvadoran countryside, um, collecting DNA samples. Um, this is a photograph of Margarita. She's one of the staff um, people at ProBusca. She still works at ProBusca. She's actually a former guerrilla fighter, and she's collecting a DNA sample from um, a relative of a disappeared child. And this is another relative, a disappeared child. I took this photograph, and he's providing a thumbprint on the chain of custody form. Um, and so when people provided thumbprints, it was because they they didn't they they weren't able to write. But um, I was the next signature on the chain of custody. And the end of the summer, I brought all the samples back to California, um, and they were analyzed, um, and that led to some matches. But at what the other thing that happened when I was in El Salvador in the summer is that. When you go around to collect DNA samples, people start remembering the war and they told me so many stories. And honestly, it was kind of overwhelming. I was very fortunate that um, Ferli Bourgois, who's with us now, was also on my master's thesis committee. Um, and he's an anthropologist. And before I went to El Salvador for that summer, he said, write field notes. I honestly had never taken an anthropology course in my life. I still haven't, um, but I'm fortunate to have had the guidance of Philippe. Um, so Philippe showed me what field notes look like, and I said, oh, okay. And so I just, um, whenever there was downtime, I would write and write just what the families were saying. Um, was all I was doing was hearing the stories and then getting them out of my head and writing them. And um, I sent about five batches of, of field notes home, and Philippe was actually reading them and said, keep writing. Um, and that's actually what became my book was finally sitting down and editing the field notes. So um, this photograph um, is a photograph of Andrea, um, the, the first disappeared ch child found with her mother, the, the mother you saw holding the picture of her missing seven-year-old. Um, this photograph um, was taken on New Year's Day in 2006. Um, and it was the day after I interviewed her parents. So after my first summer in El Salvador in 2005, um, I went back that winter break. So this all centers around the academic calendar and being a student. Um, and I did um, 50 semi-structured interviews with the disappeared children and their relatives to understand their process of separation and reunification and um, eventually anal analyze those and wrote papers as a stepping stone to you know, finally being able to wrap my head around the material and write a book. Um, but I'd like to pause right now and, and read you an excerpt um, of the book, um, which is here. Um, and there's that, that same picture of Andrea and her mom on the cover. Um, and if any of you have the book, the back cover this was so special to put together the book and learn about this. This is um, a young man who reunited with his mother through a cold hit match in the DNA bank. So he was in Australia and they would not have found him without the DNA bank. Um, okay, but back to Andrea, I'm going to read you um, pretty much from the moment of this 
photograph. Back at Andrea's parents' place at 11 a.m. on New at 11 on New Year's Eve, I interview her parents as I have yet to hear their perspective. You know that war is terrible, Andrea's father begins, but it's one thing to hear about war and another to suffer it in your own skin. He tells me about the 1982 Guinda de Mayo when Andrea was seven and about the shrapnel that cut the air at nine in the morning, severing her arm. FM FMLN medics attended to Andrea, but they had limited supplies and it was a miracle she didn't contract tetanus, her parents say. With nothing to cover her arm, she slept for 24 hours. They had to flee, but shrapnel had wounded Andrea's hip too and she couldn't walk, her father says. Still bleeding with her arm bone sticking out, Andrea and her family of 12 faced, quote, bombs from above and from the ground um, as they raced to survive. I ask about the moment Andrea became separated from her family. I know from Andrea's testimony that while running from bombs and bullets, Andrea's father came to a ravine he couldn't cross carrying two children in his arms. Together, the three would die. So as Andrea has told me without blame, he set Andrea down, the child who could no longer walk, leaving her with, quote, the dead and wounded. He escaped with the other child. Unlike Andrea, her parents won't discuss her disappearance. They remain quiet and after a long silence of wearing top facial expressions, Andrea's father lets out a breath and thanks God that she was taken safely to an orphanage. It seems they still carry guilt and shame. Would it help them to know that Andrea forgives them? It's unclear how much Andrea and her parents have discussed her disappearance. The tone of Andrea's mother and father changes to joy when they tell me about finding Andrea. He, her, her parents spent years in the refugee camp in Honduras before repatriation to Warhila. They had limited means and there wasn't yet a process to search for disappeared children. Then after 12 years of separation, Andrea's parents gained hope that Andrea might be alive when their nephew, a former soldier, told them that he'd picked up some children from Chalatenango during the war. Andrea didn't speak with her family again until she was 19 at her reunion in Warhila, arranged through Father John and what would become Probusqueda. Andrea told me that her reunion with her parents and nine siblings felt like a dream come true. Her vivacious laughter mixed into tears only once during our interview together, when she talked about seeing for the first time her brother Rutilio, who had my Andrea's face. The odd familiarity felt overwhelming. Andrea's mother says that at the reunion they quote, all cried from happiness hugging her. She adds, since we first saw her, she's loved us as if we'd been with her the whole time. Then Andrea's father speaks to today. Thanks to God, we're happy because Andrea visits us and we know that she's well. Andrea's positivity mirrors her parents. I always see the present, which is very good now, Andrea said in our interview. Andrea's reunification process is the happiest I've seen and yet her parents' pain is still so apparent. After the interview, we listen to firecrackers announcing the new year in Warhila, and we all hug. I climb onto a cot on Andrea's parents' patio and sleep. So reunion is of the book. is It's about a lot of things. It's, it's mostly about the family stories um, with the separations and the reunification process. It, it tells their, their experiences with the Civil War. Um, and I was also learning about what, what in that moment in time was present day El Salvador 2005, the aftermath of the Civil War, the gang violence, the ongoing poverty and the new separations. At the time that I was in El Salvador, you saw that big photo of Andrea's reunion. Um, there was the, only her youngest sibling was still in El Salvador and Andrea. Everyone else had um, gone to the United States for economic reasons. Um, and so it felt so important to share these stories because of the importance of documenting it historically and because of these new cycles of separation um, and reunification that we're repeating. So um, I hope you can see that through Andrea. Um, reunion also, um, the, the third part of the second part of reunion 
is um, the the fifty the salient interviews from the fifty interviews I did that in winter two thousand five, um, and then the third part follows a wonderful young woman named Angela, um, who I met in El Salvador. I actually collected her DNA sample. She was adopted and grew up in Berkeley, California, um, and um, through, with the DNA sample and and through Pro Busqueda, her biological mother was found, and so she had a phone reunion um, with her. Her mom um, in my little apartment in Berkeley. Um, and for those of you who are <laughs> doctors or went to medical school with me, you probably have had the same additions. Here's the pathologic basis of disease. And this was the current medical diagnosis and treatment book because as a JMP student, we are always <laughs> looking things up to teach each other. Um, and so the third part of reunion follows um, Angela's story, their phone reunion, and we go back to El Salvador together um, where she meets her biological mother. And so this is a photo from um, the day of um, Angela's reunion with her biological mother and her brother. And um, that that's the kind of main part of, of what reunion has. And I just want to touch briefly on how I've brought this work into the present. Um, through Eric Stover and um, through this book, I've really come to understand the importance of the right to identity and um, continue to be involved with the use of DNA to support family reunification. And so we formed a group called DNA Bridge um, that the mission is to advocate for the humanitarian use of DNA so that we never again have a child, a lost child separated from their family because we cannot identify the child. So this is something that I've been working on kind of on the side. And um, our group actually had an article published in Science um, about um, how to use DNA to reunify separate, separated migrant families, because it's very important that if it is used, it's used correctly. Um, and um, and I, now I want to bring us to some very special parts of the book. So um, the reunion, as I mentioned, there is a, a really great forward by Philippe that um, describes the social political context of the Salvadoran Civil War and the methodological context of, of me as a participant observer um, in El Salvador, work, working with Pro Busqueda and the families of the disappeared. Um, and then at the end of the book, there's two very special appendices. So the first appendix, um, is Philippe's photo ethnography from um, actually being a survivor of the Salvadoran Civil War. Um, Philippe, do you want to um, unmute and tell us about this photograph? Sure, sure. Thank you, um, uh, thank you, Liz, and and um, and and thank you, the audience, for for listening. Uh, the um, I, I actually were, I was a professor at the time. That Liz was um, was was a medical student, and she actually just wandered into my office. I actually I, I I trust her memory better than mine, but but I had office hours, I think, and she asked um, she asked to learn how to do anthropological fieldwork methods, um, and whatever I actually also was so excited by her project, I was trying to persuade her to not just take one year and get a master's, but to take uh, four years or five years off and get a PhD in anthropology. I wasn't able to persuade her. And thank God, because that enabled her to become a pediatrician much faster and do more important work. Um, uh, but the, um, the project that she did is really amazing um, because it involved transferring the most advanced technology that existed in the world at that point that luckily was in San Francisco. And Liz, with her charisma, managed to get the uh, forensic um, um, geneticists who were working in San Francisco to donate their time and the technology. And she physically brought it down with her uh, on her in her in her um, in her uh, luggage, uh, you know, in her airline luggage bags, to set up that database that has become a global database that's united thousands of of children who are separated, often kidnapped directly in scorched earth massacres. So the the these pictures, this is what I looked like at that time when I was. Um, a PhD graduate student attempting to do field work in the middle of the Salvadoran Civil War. 
Um, and that, that picture is taken in a refugee camp um, after, um, uh, this is this, this, the, the picture in the center with the little boy um, is where I had begun my field work. I had gotten permission. Well, I had just crossed the border illegally into the guerrilla controlled zone to ask for permission to do field work um, in, in, in those territories to find out how people survived in that terrible moment of history and, and what daily life was like. And um, two days after I arrived there, the Salvadoran military launched one of its typical scorched earth operations. That's when they surround a territory. In this case, it was maybe, um, you know, I don't know, maybe 80, you know, 80 kilometer periphery territory, 12 hamlets were in that territory about. And then they um, bomb it and then come in on foot and try to kill everyone. And Philippe, I think you muted. Okay, sorry. Um, is that better? Okay. Yeah, my cat jumped on my computer. I apologize. <laughs> um, so, um, so th this last this this was the picture right in the beginning. We were hiding in front of that in front of that cave. This is a cave that this dark hole in the middle next to the woman in purple, and um, that that little boy survived. You see him. Um, a year later, or a year and a half later, in the refugee camp in Honduras, we we basically fled for eleven days, hiding during the day and fleeing at night, and hundreds of us were killed. Um, but um, luckily, um, most of us survived. There were about a thousand four hundred or two thousand of us. It was hard to know in total because everything is mayhem, as you can imagine, in a scorched earth massacre. So I'll I'll. Um, I'll, I'll, I should, uh, uh, sorry to bombard you with that, but what's extraordinary about, uh, about Liz's book that she writes about, um, about that moment of history and the stories of the children like this little boy who, who survived these massacres um, with, with an empathy and, uh, and a tenderness that um, brings out um, the beauty uh, and and gives one hope in the midst of the horror of the accounts of war. So it's a beautifully written book. It's it, it it she also has the she she has a certain genius for writing, and so it's written like a coming of age story. It's her coming of age story. So you actually meet her her husband when he's still her boyfriend at that time, Mark, um, and he comes down with her. And ever since he's been um, a partner to her, organizing. Uh, helping you know or her her do her work as a as a human rights physician who's now doing extraordinarily important work um, at the board at the U.S. border around around children separated from their parents. But even more importantly, she's also working with children in juvenile detainment in juvenile hall in the Los Angeles. She's actually known as the juvie doctor or just our juvie doctor by her patients. Um, and and um, and does dedicated work uh, to and to a very um, a very uh, suffering and complex population whose whose lives she often helps turn around. So thank you, Liz, for the work that you do, and thank you for. Uh, did you? I want to make sure that anyone in the audience who knows someone who's Salvadoran who um, um, is from that generation of the of the nineteen eighties. Um, or or has relatives who were in that generation of the 1980s should get their cheeks swabbed. They should contact Pro Buscada, the organization that Liz co-founded with the with the surviving children, um, because children are getting found every every day up till the very present moment. So um, so it's an it's it's an extraordinary accomplishment that uh, that you were able to do, Liz. Thank you for that. Thank you so much, Philippe, for all of your support and teaching through the years. Um, yeah, so Philippe makes a very excellent point. So um, people who were 
born in the era of the Civil War and were separated from their families, if people were who were adopted, or if you know someone who was adopted from El Salvador in the 1980s, um, you, I, you're welcome to encourage them to get a, a DNA cheek swab. It's free. Um, and they can do that by contacting Pro Busqueda in El Salvador, as Felipe has said, um, or the UC Berkeley Human Rights Center, or you're welcome to contact me and I'm happy to put you in touch. Um, and, and then it's important to know that everything that happens there, and we see this through Angela's story in the book, everything is, it's really a person's choice. Some people decide um, that they want to have an in-person reunion. Some people decide that it's just, it's enough to know that they have, have biological family that exists, or there's letter exchange, or there's phone calls. One of the things I learned is that um, the reunification process, it really operates on a spectrum. Um, so I'm going to move on. There's one more slide to show you guys. Um, so one of the parts of the process of discovery was that Philippe was very generous in sharing his photographs. It's remarkable that he actually has photographs from during the war. Um, and then within that archive, I found a, photo, a children's drawing. Um, and then when I talked to Philippe about it, I learned that there were more. Um, and so this is a, draw, a, a drawing and it's, it's part of a set of drawings that Philippe collected with children um, who were in the Honduran refugee camps. And the second appendix in reunion, we include the children's drawings with brief annotation. Um, for me as an ethnographer researcher, it really stood out to me how much what the children were saying with their drawings triangulated, um, you know, or completely corroborated um, what the families of the disappeared were telling me 20 years later, and also what Philippe was saying with his own testimony. Um, I, I sort of want to let this drawing <laughs> speak for itself. Philippe, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, um, only that the what 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 it's 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 terribly sad to see a drawing like this. What was beautiful about collecting the drawings in the elementary school in the elementary schools that were operating in the refugee camp, that the process of drawing these pictures for the children, who as you can see in, in this particular picture, is drawn by Milagro, who's nine years old. Um, she signs it at the bottom, or he signs it at the bottom. And um, for them, it was a, 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 a therapeutic process to convey that. They knew that it was going to be viewed by an international audience because I would bring it to their teachers and explain that we wanted their perspective to, to reach the public, the terrible injustice that was happening to their, um, to their rural communities. And they basically poured their souls out um, and as you can see, would use colors to illustrate, it, it, you know, very, very powerfully the wounds, the bleeding, and so forth. So it, it's it, it's an, they're extraordinary drawings for an extraordinary people. And all these 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 are all the children that survived. They're now, um, you know, uh, in their fifties, <laughs> or and and um, and um, it. it it, it's um it gives one hope in the midst of 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 all the horrors of war uh people are capable of surviving and um and and retaining their humanity even when they've witnessed so much trauma thank you um so just to wrap up the the presentation part so how can you help um share reunion with your friends and families all author proceeds from the book are being donated to Pro Busquera and to the community in Cabanas that helped Philippe survive and other causes related to the disappeared children of El Salvador. I have found that even just getting the word out about the book title um, has value in terms of spreading awareness about the book. I've already been contacted by a number of people saying, hey, I was ad adopted in El Salvador in the 1980s. Um, and this process through the years, and even when I was a medical student, when there were cycles of, of this work getting attention, it led to more children getting found. Um, there's, these are specific organizations if you're interested. Uh oh, sorry, I don't know if you can still see it. Um, can you still see the slides? I, I pressed a button. Okay, well, there was, there was a list. Oh, here, I can get it back up. Um, okay, these are organizations, Pro Busqueda, 
Aves in Santa Marta Cabañas, DNA Bridge is the, is the now a nonprofit that, that I told you about. Carecen and Kind are excellent organizations that work with migrant children. And here it is in writing, if, if to initiate a search, contact Pro Busqueda, UC Berkeley Human Rights Center, or anyone's welcome to contact me. Um, and that is the end of the slide portion. Um, and I'm really excited to, to hear your questions. Thank you. So Liz, could you, um, I'll just, while we wait for people to type in questions, how did you um, tell the story of getting the technology down and, and, and how you actually developed a protocol for keeping track of it, for interviewing people, and, and also about that extraordinarily charismatic uh, Jesuit priest who essentially was your mentor in El Salvador, who uh, was a was a crucial figure in making this possible as well, John Cord Father John Cortina. Yes, absolutely. So the DNA Bank, it was really a collaborative project between Pro Busqueda, UC Berkeley Human Rights Center, and Physicians for Human Rights. And I walked in just as this medical student, and that it was just about to get a momentum. And they said, oh, she's going to be down there this summer. And so it, um, essentially, um, there was there's a Chilean geneticist, a, a remarkable person named Cristian Orego. He was working at the California Department of Justice. And so he arranged for um, California Department of Justice geneticists to be able to analyze the DNA samples pro bono after hours. He actually got permission from California's attorney general. Um, and then he also arranged for me to get training in, in forensic genetic software. Um, and so I got trained in that software. And part of that was I got given an ancient laptop that had this this um, this D, it was called DNA View software, and that was actually what I took down and what I wrote field notes on. Um, and um, these two organizations, UC Berkeley and Physicians for Human Rights, helped Provost get get the DNA swabs um, and to develop the protocols with the chain of custody. And one really important part of Father John Cortina's and Christian's vision was that the DNA bank would ultimately be self-sustaining. And so now, um, you know, I've walked away from the project for many years to, to, to pursue my medical training, residency, et cetera, but Pro Busqueda runs the DNA bank by itself, um, which is really beautiful. Um, as you mentioned, Father John Cortina, he was a true hero. He was from Spain, um, survived many assassination attempts, survived the war, um, and then helped. He was a mentor, mentee of um, St. Oscar Romero, and he was a mentor to me, as you said, when I was in El Salvador. Um, and he was the spiritual leader and also the, the you know, the, the executive director of Pobusqueda. And so much of this was his vision. Um, and I was really fortunate to spend time with him. And I'm um, one part of reunion is is talking about him as a hero who I think really deserves to be recognized by history. There's some there's some questions uh, uh, about um, about uh, the security of of uh, DNA data databases um, and 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 how how that gets protected in terms of people being able to um, get themselves swabbed without fearing that the data will be misused as uh, uh, you know for, you know for, to to get them in trouble in some way. Yes, that's a great question. And probably when I was in El Salvador in 2005, I did not understand those details. But now as part of this um, DNA bridge organization, that's exactly what we're working on. So um, as our um, attendees has very astutely pointed out that this is one of the big risks of DNA is, is risks of breach of confidentiality and, and um um, and so what's key to understand is that there are ways to put safeguards in place. So in that science article that I mentioned, we propose a, um, an approach where an NGO, well, actually, I'm going to back up and say, 
what this what this framework is building from is that DNA is used for what's called disaster victim identification. It's kind of the go to if there's like you know a, the 9/11, etc. Um, and then we've had these movements, the Argentina's um, grandmothers of the disappeared and Pro Buscara, where the rare instances where DNA has been used for living family reunifications. And so now this new framework puts those two contexts together. Um, and so the idea is an NGO or some kind of agency on the ground that the community trusts would collect the DNA sam samples, just like Pro Buscara has done in the context of the civil war in El Salvador. Um, and then an international, an intergovernmental organization that has treaty level protections like the International Commission um, for Missing Persons, the ICMP, um, would then analyze, would run the DNA samples, um, and there would be sort of, and they would have de-identified samples. Um, and then if there's a match, um, that match would then be reported back to the NGO that would work with the families. And so the idea is that this could happen in collaboration or cooperation with governments, but very importantly, be separated from governments. Um, so it is, uh, we believe it's feasible to do, and I think it's actually, it's our human rights obligation to use DNA, um, you know, if, if it's needed, um, if, if it can be done safely. So really frustrating for me um, to be sitting, reading the news in 2022, and to start seeing those first New York Times articles about the Ukrainian children um, that Russia has stolen. And now the most recent reporting is that Russia has stolen up to 150,000 children um, from Ukraine. Um, and and we're, I think what we're seeing is that same dynamic of children becoming a spoil of war. Um, and so our organization DNA Bridge is, is involved with um, you know, saying, hey, if there's a use for DNA, we're here to, to help. So um, I'm happy to answer any more questions about it. But I think what's important to understand is that there are risks for, to use DNA and that they are overcomable. I actually have an NIH um, proposal under review to help answer some of these scientific questions around that as well. Um, some another uh, attendee asks about your your writing process. Um, where did where did you get your genius for writing? Were you always uh, a writer in high school, or or what, what? What? How did you? Or are you just lucky? <laughs> that, that's very kind. Um, I I wrote in a journal in high school, just kind of you know processing my own life, just personal writing. Um, I took a poetry class um, when I was an undergraduate at UC Berkeley. And then, um, like I said, then I was just hearing the stories of the families. And it's interesting that um, I didn't really plan this, but the book is written in first person. And I think part of that is and, and, and in present tense. Um, and I think part of that is because so much storytelling in Spanish happens in present tense. But I was literally just this person said this, this person said this, and then this, and then this happened. And I was just it, um, writing it all down. And then... Um, through the years and the process of editing, I think I've learned a little bit about writing and my husband did help me a lot with the writing. He's also a great writer. Um, but it, I think the power of the writing is really the power of the testimonies. Um, and, and as Philippe also alluded to, the resiliency of, of the families. You also tape recorded a lot, didn't you? Well, that's the funny thing that I don't really talk about, but that first summer, the first half of the book, there was no audio recording. Oh, really? Oh, I, wow. I weirdly just memorized like a couple of days of conversation. So if there were three days in the field, I memorized everything. I don't, you know, <laughs> that when you're a medical student, your mind is prim primed to memorize. <laughs> um, and then I would write everything down so I wouldn't have to memorize it anymore. And then it would leave me. Um, and then when I went back, I did the 50 interviews um, and those were audio recorded. And so what the, the part two of the book is kind of combining my memories from back when I wrote my field notes with the interview transcripts. And when I was editing, um, I, I was I would often go back to the transcripts, particularly in, in areas where I felt like I wasn't finding enough meaning. Um, and as I said, as we've said, I'm not formally trained in anthropology, but one of the things I've come to understand from the anthropology literature is that 
um, there's a there's a lot of an analytic process that happens during writing. And so for me, a lot of that happened with with the editing, editing and the refinement of the writing. And I must say the 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 children who as adults became the founding leaders and continue to be active in in Pro Buscada are just are just you know, they're 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 extraordinarily charismatic. Um, and and they invited you into their families, and you you write you write about the the, the tenderness of them uh, struggling to recreate new lives after having lost their parents and and lost their childhoods in 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 um, in in asylums and and um, in adoption you know in adoption settings. Uh, that they managed to survive. There's there's plenty of thousands who didn't survive, um, and and we don't know you know how, you know how they are doing whether they have to live live with that loss. Um, but um, but but um, the, the, do you know the the what the latest number of reunited um, children are at this point and generally who are they reunited with because often their parents were killed is it, it it's with an uncle and an aunt or or a cousin or a brother or sister yeah i think andrea is the only person i know who reunited that i can think of off the top of my head who reunited with both parents and every sibling in a family that large um so the number I have in the book as of 2020, um, which is when we sent the book to University of California Press, um, 994 cases of disappeared children had been registered with ProBuscada and 443 had been resolved. Um, and again, it's probably about tens, tens of thousands that have disappeared. In terms of who the um, the disappeared children reunited with. So if they didn't have a mother or father, it was often an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent. Um, for some of them, they were reuniting with older siblings. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you to UCSF for hosting me back, for being such a wonderful medical school. Thank you for LEAP for being such a wonderful mentor um, for so many years. And I'm happy to hear from any of you. Um, thank you all for joining this presentation.